Daniel chapter 6. Pastor Kelly has already read the text for us. So I would ask you to pray with me. Let's seek God's help. Our Father, we call in your name and we ask that you would, by your Spirit's work and power, open our eyes to see and open our ears to hear. We pray that you would bend our wills to yours, that your word would go out today and accomplish everything that you would have it to do. Father, we thank you for, your, for this gift that is your revelation of yourself to us. We pray, guard our hearts from being hearers only. Guard us from looking into the mirror and walking away unchanged. We pray this in our Savior's great and mighty name. Amen. Well, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, it, it generally doesn't take you all that long to to run into Mr. Diedrich Bonhoeffer's uh, summary of the Christian life. He said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Generally, it doesn't take you very long to have either read it or have a pastor read it. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Or You don't have to read very far in your Bibles before you run into well, one of many saints by our Lord, but let's just take Luke 9, 23 through 25. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? forfeits his soul. I doubt that that was news to any of us in this room, right? We have all heard those, we've all read those, and, and yet knowing all of that, knowing that Christ says the Christian life is a life of perpetual dying, knowing that Christ depicts the Christian life as perpetual cross bearing, knowing that martyrs like Bonhoeffer who have gone ahead of us as older brothers in the faith, have said that when, the, that when you're called to be a Christian, you did not sign up for a vacation or a trip to Disneyland. You signed up for daily dying. No, knowing all that, that's not news to any of us. And yet knowing all that, we still, we, we live such careful, calculated, risk-free, fearful, little Christian lives. There's not the boldness we would expect. Uh, there's not the courage we would expect. We, we read accounts in the scriptures. We read accounts in church history, and, and we don't necessarily experience those ourselves. And so uh, the question that I want to ask in light of that, the question that I want to ask you, the question I am forced to ask myself is this. Why is that? Why is it? I could understand that we would live uh, overly cautious, wanting a risk-free life if we didn't know that that's what Christ called us to. If we were ignorant of these things, I could understand it. But knowing what we know, why do we still live such risk-free lives? I think the answer in part, and I'm not arguing that this is all of the answer, that I can fix it all in one sermon at all, but I think that part of the answer is this. We are not convinced of the sovereign, providential, kind care of God. You might say, well, you're saying that to a room full of Calvinists. How can you say that we aren't convinced of the sovereign providence of God? That's what we're about. Oh, yes, on, on paper, 100%. That's what we're about. But have those truths worked down into our bones as Christians? Are, are we a people that, that in our heart of hearts can truthfully and by faith say, God is sovereign over all things, 
His, his providential care of me is so kind, so gracious, I can live full tilt for him. Enduring risk, enduring danger, dying to self, and I can do it all joyfully, not, not with a sour face. I can do it joy-filledly because of his care for me is so comprehensive. I can only speak for myself. That truth is not burrowed down into my bones nearly as deeply as I need it to. And I feel like I'm not alone. I feel like we all need to be reminded and encouraged on this truth and what a story set before us today to show that I want to, by God's word in Daniel chapter 6, encourage you all, us all, to trust in the providential care of God and as a result of that trust and that faith in his providential care to then live bold, courageous lives for the gospel. Bold, courageous lives, willing to risk and be risked, poured out for the cause of our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ. And what a story to show us that in Daniel chapter 6. I want to look at this narrative with you, and I want to hang our thoughts on, on four headings. The first will be this, uh, the prohibition on prayer, verses 1 through 9. The story opens in the, uh, a new kingdom. As you remember, Babylon was ended in the last kingdom due to the uh, very unique governing style of Belshazzar. Uh, chapter 6 opens up with the new ruler, Darius. And before we get very far into the text, I know there's enough history-savvy folks out there to know that uh, there is some confusion as to who this person is. Uh, history refers to Cyrus the Great. Isaiah refers to Cyrus the Great. And yet Daniel chapter 6 calls this ruler of the Medo-Persian Empire Darius. You might say, well, is, were there, was Darius a commander? Was Darius a, a lesser ruler? Who, who was this Darius? And without getting into all of the historics on it, if you want to know more about that, I direct you to Mr. Worley. He likes talking about history far more than I do. I'm convinced that the best explanation is that Darius and Cyrus are indeed the same person. So Darius being his Medo-Persian or his Medo name or Median name, uh, Cyrus being his Persian name. And if you want to nerd out with me just for two seconds, look at verse 28. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius... And I would take that and there to be what's called an ex, ex, ep, exegetical use of a conjunction. I know that you were hoping that those words would be uttered in your presence this morning. It means it would go something like this. That Daniel served under, under and prospered under the reign of Darius, who is also Cyrus. So I believe them to be the same person. If you disagree, excellent. But let's move on because I don't think the point of the text is to say go out and be like Darius or Cyrus or whoever it is. The text says that this ruler of the Medo-Persian Empire sets up his government and he, he orders it with 120 lesser rulers and above them he puts three. And Daniel is one of those three. Now remember, Daniel is in his mid-80s, so he, he rejected this idea of retirement and he is still serving God not in Babylon any longer, but, he, but he's serving God where God has planted him and he's still serving in, in the new empire, and his goal is the same as it has always been. Seek the good of the city in which God has planted you. That's what Daniel is doing, and he seems to be doing a really good job on it because it says that he's the best of the three. He was distinguished among them, verse 3 says, and it was the king's intent to make him the number one. So, so it seems that Darius is so impressed with Daniel, with the gifting that, remember from chapter 1, God gave to Daniel. He's so impressed with the gifting that God gave Daniel that he says, you know what, I'm going to do away with these other two guys. I'm going to make Daniel the number one. I'm going to vacation somewhere else and let Daniel run the kingdom flawlessly. So Daniel's doing what he's done the entirety of the book. He is faithfully following God in the midst of pagan cultures, seeking the good of those around him, even in exile. And that's the setting upon which our story 
unfolds. Verse 4, there are other political persons who, shock of all shocks, uh, want more power than they already have. Nothing's really changed about the human condition, has it? So verse 4, these other officials are seeking to find a complaint against Daniel. And so they are searching through his Twitter feed, his Facebook posts, and they're trying to find, has he ever posted a news article that ended up not being right? I mean, it's easy to find, isn't it? Or has he ever retweeted someone who was accidentally or overtly racist? I mean, something, can we find anything on this guy? And they turn over every rock and they cannot find a way in which Daniel has not been just exemplary. It's the way we should conduct ourselves in public, isn't it? They look for a way. Daniel, far from rounding off the corners of his integrity in his old age, he is serving God with just as much zeal as when he was a young man. So verse 5, they say, well, we have to alter our tactics then. If we can't find you know, things that he's posted on social media that will get him in trouble. Well, let's go after his God. Because if we know one thing about Daniel, we know that, that if we can drive a wedge and make him choose between faithfulness to God and faithfulness even to the king of Medo-Persia, we've got him. It may be an observation of the text and not the driving point, but do you think Daniel's faith was a very private thing? No, even his enemies knew he walks, lives, and works under one law, God's. Even his political opponents knew this man is a man of faith. It's not an ambiguous faith. It's a very defined faith. And so they look at Daniel's practice. They look at what is commanded in God's law, and they hatch a plan that goes something like this. Uh, Darius or Cyrus or Darius however you want to pronounce it or say it, uh, one of the ways that it seems he sought to ingratiate himself to the people he'd conquered was to take the idols that Babylon had brought back and to actually send them back as a, as a gesture of good faith. Remember when um, Nebuchadnezzar took over Jerusalem, he took articles of their worship, brought them back. He did that with everybody. And so Babylon was kind of a stockpile of other nations' gods, And one of the things it seems like Darius or Cyrus did was to send them back to the countries from which they came. You could imagine that would be a gesture of good faith. And maybe it was during that time where these uh, individuals came to him and said, Darius, a lot of gods are in transit right now. People don't know who to pray. Do they pray to Marduk? Do they pray to Sin? Do they pray to Bel? It's a confusing time. It may be helpful for us to, for 30 days, say, all prayer will uh, siphon through or run through the king. Not be made to him, but, but, but kind of made through him. So the, their proposal was this. Darius, we're going to make you the one mediator between gods and, and men, the, the Mede, Darius. And he goes along with it. They set a time limit on it. It's only 30 days to, I don't know how they sold it to him. Perhaps they said, hey, you know, there, there is a, a spike in religious concern at the moment. Let's take 30 days and flatten that curve. Maybe it's too soon for that. I'm sorry. So, so fix 30 days. And it won't go anything beyond that. <laughs> I won't get in trouble for anything I'm about to say. So, he signs off on it. He puts it into law. And one of the uniquenesses of the law of the Medes and the Persians was it couldn't be revoked even by the king. Could you imagine being Daniel, having given your whole life to serving God, and one day, unbeknownst to you, I'm sure, they they claim it was the idea of everyone. I can't imagine Daniel signed off on it. But Daniel finds out about it. And so we'll note, secondly, that religion comes with a risk. Religion comes with a risk. That we'll see this in verses 10 through 11. Which one of those political opponents do you think volunteered first and quickest to go tell Daniel about the new memo? Imagine with great delight and smugness they handed him the decree, ink still wet from, from Darius's pen. Oh, Daniel, did, did you see the new memo that went out this morning? Have to pray to Darius for the next 30 days. 
It's for the good of the country. It's for the good of the people. You've got to do it. How does Daniel respond to that? Wouldn't, wouldn't the temptations to be angry, <laughs> be frustrated, to want to give up, to want to quit? Well, I don't read any of that in the story. In fact, there's an economy of, I would want far more detail, but Daniel writes a story with, with very few words. Verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had previously done. I want to clarify quickly what this prohibition on prayer or limiting of prayer was and what it was not. This prohibition on prayer was not... It was not a command to commit idolatry. They didn't say you must pray to, to Darius. It just says, if you are going to pray, you must pray to or through him. It's not even a command that you must pray unto Darius. If you're going to pray, then pray through him. So it's not an overt command to idolatry. It's also not a permanent suspension of worship. It's temporary. Daniel knew exactly how many days this would stay in place for. So he knows if he lays low for 30 days, guess what? It expires this uh, governor's mandate, and he's free to do as he did previously. It was also not targeted. You might say, whoa, hold on there. His, it, it seems like the political figures targeted at him. Yes, they may have. But Darius did not target it, Danny. He didn't even know it, was, it would impinge him. This was binding on all people. It wasn't targeted towards Daniel whatsoever. It doesn't matter if you pray to Yahweh as Daniel did, or Bel, or Marduk, or Sin, or any of the other plethora of gods that they had to choose from. It, it, it actually limited every citizen. It wasn't just targeted at Daniel. And that's where the real miracle, I think, of chapter 6 occurs. We would often say, if you were to ask someone, what is the miracle of, of Daniel chapter 6? That Daniel wasn't eaten by lions. I don't think that's the greatest of the miracles in this text. I think the greatest miracle in this text is that knowing what he knew, knowing what the stakes and consequences were, this faithful, God-fearing man still goes and prays. It wasn't that, that the lion's mouths were shut. It's that Daniel's knees still hit the ground. That's the true miracle. That God could transform a human heart to such a degree that it desires the worship, adoration, and praise of God more than even self-preservation. That does not naturally happen, friends. Our first inclination as self-centered people is to, at all expenses, preserve self. And here we find an 80-something-year-old prophet in a foreign land who just weeks or months before saw his life's work burn in the burning of Babylon or the destruction of Babylon. And here he is still seeking after God. Now you might say, well, interesting that the text mentions he prays towards Jerusalem. What, what is what is that about? Is that superstitious? Is that kind of a weird thing that Daniel did? Well, if you, you can either write it down or quickly turn there with me uh, to 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 46 and 40 through 48. Uh, Solomon is commemorating or, or uh, beginning worship at the, the temple that was then later named after him. And he says something very interesting with regards to how people, if they should go into exile, ought to pray, which Daniel's in exile and he's praying, so it seems like it makes a whole lot of sense. 1 Kings 8, 46, Solomon says, And if they sin against you, he's speaking of God, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them, and give them to an enemy, so that they are carried away to captivity. Do you see the connections here between... Uh, Daniel in this text, so that they're carried away to captivity to a land of the enemy. 
far off or near, yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they've been carried captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, we have sinned and we have acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who carried them uh, captive and pray to you, notice, toward their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city you have chosen, and the house you have built for your name. Solomon says, I believe, by means of the Spirit, God, if you carry your people away into exile and faithful ones in the land say, you know what, God is the God of his promises and God keeps his promises. So even though I live in exile east of Israel, I will look again towards towards the west, towards uh, Jerusalem, towards the house of God. And I will pray, banking on God's promises that he's not forgotten his people. He has not forgotten me, even in a foreign land. And God will rescue. That, that, that's the, the point behind the gesture of praying east in Daniel's case. He's saying, I know my God will, in the future, bring his people out of exile. And by even the direction I pray, I, I say by my actions, God is faithful. God is faithful. So the praying east in Daniel's case was a, a gesture of faith. Well, why pray three times a day? It seems like these are stated or scheduled times of prayer. Daniel has in, in this book both scheduled times of prayer and uh, non-scheduled times of prayer. Both are helpful, both needed. Well, where would he get this idea of praying three times a day? Maybe he's patterning his life after Psalm 55 verse 16. Where David says, but I called to God, and the Lord will save me, evening, and morning, and at noon. I don't know if Daniel was patterning his life off that or not. One, the one thing we ought to learn is that stated times of prayer are desperately needful. But, but that, is, that, that is the kind of person that, that Daniel was. He's praying by faith. He's committed to prayer. He has scheduled prayer, and he won't budge off of his prayer. And that's the context into which this prohibition against prayer comes. Now, you can imagine with me. You know my imagination is a dangerous thing. You can imagine the, if there were, um, well, people who wrote blogs recorded podcasts, and had access to the beast that rises from the ocean, Twitter and Facebook, what they would be saying to Daniel. Other, other believers, perhaps, that, that lived in the same time as Daniel, they see this governmental mandate come down. They see it's 30 days to flatten a religious anxiety curve. And, uh, and imagine what they would say. Now, I wonder if, if Mr. Jonathan Lehman were alive back then as he is today, if he would say the very same things that he says now. Daniel, are you sure you want to spend your political capital on this? Daniel, you're about to be made second in command. If you don't, don't die on this hill, Daniel. There's a bigger fight coming, and guess what? You're going to be, you're going to be in a position of power as second in command. Are you sure you want to spend your capital now? Maybe others said, Daniel, consider your neighbors. Windows open? They'll see you, and they'll, what will they think when they see you, a believer in Yahweh, uh, breaking the law? Imagine. What if you're witness, Daniel? Others, I'm sure, uh, passively, aggressively told him on Facebook, uh, Daniel, you're not being targeted. You're, you're not. This, this is equally, this is against everybody. And because you're not being targeted and you're not being commanded to sin, uh, Romans 13, they would say Romans 13 prophetically, of course. <laughs> Daniel, don't you know that Cyrus was put there by God? And he was. Maybe others, and this is exactly, I think, beautifully captured by uh, the commentator Dale Ralph Davis. Ralph Davis. Dale Ralph Davis. He says, I wonder what Daniel's calculations would have been 
had he been a typical pragmatic American. I have no choice. The law is the law, and I am forced to cease to pray. Dale Raff wrote these things in 2013, and I find them almost prophetic to our, our current time. I'm sure others would have told Daniel, Daniel, you're being too rigid. You're being too strict. Just modify your practice. Get creative in how you worship. Get creative to work around the mandate. It's, it's temporary. It's short. It's not long-lasting. Get creative, Daniel. Go for a walk. And when you turn looking west on the main street and praying your heart, God sees your heart. You're facing east. You've got all the pieces. I mean, yeah, you're not in your normal setting where you like to pray, but don't civilly disobey based on the lack of convenience. I'm positive someone has said that. Maybe you'd say, well, I think maybe you're reading too much into this story. This is a description of what happened. Maybe not a prescription. Some would look at the story of Daniel. They would look at what, he, what he's doing is nothing short of civil disobedience. Let's just call what we're seeing in the text what it is. He's, he's disobeying his government. Some would look at that and say that's simply describing what he did. It's not saying we should do likewise. And, and that, is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. But if we believe for a moment that Daniel's um, practice, Daniel's actions are more on the foolish sides of the accounting of what foolish people did, like the book of Judges, rather than the actions of a faithful man of God. Ezekiel says, a man so faithful and righteous, the only two people in company with him would have been Job and Noah. I don't think Daniel's being foolish. I think Daniel's being held up as an example of someone who feared God. One more quote from uh, Dale Raff Davis. He says, the most tempting idol to Daniel in this circumstance was not Darius's quasi-divinity, the, the command to pray through him. It may likely have been Daniel's own security. Daniel had to answer the question, what matters most, the worship of God or my safety? His response shows that he so much as said, I must not make an idol out of my own safety, and so by prayer I destroy that idol. Daniel was able to see the actual issue. He knew that he was not facing a minor religious inconvenience. What a question to ask. What matters most, the worship of God or my own personal safety? Isn't that the question at the heart of this story? It is. Isn't that also the question at the heart of so many questions we've had to ask ourselves in the last, seems like forever, but it's only been nine months. What matters most? I'm sure Daniel was told, stay home and pray safe. And he said, you know what? Something far more important than my safety is at play here. It's the worship of the living God. And so, what does he do? He doesn't alter his practice. He doesn't hide. He doesn't capitulate. He prays. I want to notice, just as he was accustomed to, so it's not like Daniel was like, I always pray with the windows closed. I'm sticking it to the man, and I'm going to open this business. No, that's not what he said at all. Daniel is not sticking it to anybody. Daniel is continuing to faithfully worship God, and whether man sees it or not, he doesn't seem to care much about. His primary audience in worship, his only audience, is God. And so he doesn't shy away from what he's been used to doing, nor does he try to stick it to anybody and make it more obvious. He simply continues to do what he had always done. And so he prayed. And you can imagine his political opponents had set up chairs, lawn chairs, 
on roofs slightly higher because they knew that at noon and in the morning and in the evening, this old guy goes out and prays without fail. And they see him. Now, why was Daniel not... I know we say he wasn't afraid. I'm sure fear was in his heart, in his mind. I'm sure that he wrestled through anxieties and fears and, and, and those of the sort. But his actions don't depict them. He doesn't seem to fear, or at least not fear ultimately, the lions that are threatened him. Why do you think that was? Why do you think this, this old guy was just not afraid of the lions? Maybe... He thought, you know what, my life has been a good run. Martyr's death, martyr's crown, not a bad way to go out. I don't think that's what he was thinking. I believe that Daniel wasn't afraid of the lions for a reason that the text already gives us. I mean, so I didn't read that when I was looking at it. Look at verse 10 and 11 again. He went to his house, he opened his windows in the upper chamber, he got down on his knees three times a day, and he prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. I believe his, his times in prayer shaped him to such an extent that he wasn't afraid. Three times a day, Daniel went and wrestled the lion that is from the tribe of Judah. And that is a far more fierce line than anything Babylon had in any dens. Daniel wrestled with God in prayer. And because he had done business every day with the line that is from the tribe of Judah, the, the, the kittens of Babylon really weren't a much of a concern to him. They weren't. It's as though you could even ask Daniel, like, Daniel, aren't you afraid of government authority? Th that also is answered in the text. He gets down on his knees, which, which is a, a that, that is something you do when in the presence of a king. Daniel doesn't bow anywhere else in the whole book. He bows here, indicating if you could kind of rearrange it this way. You want to talk about governmental authority? I I'm speaking to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's no other government outside or above him. I, I know whose presence I'm in, and it's the King of Kings. I think that's why Daniel did what he did. He didn't have a concept of a risk-free Christianity. He didn't have a concept that his faith would cost him nothing. And so he can live boldly. He can live courageously. He could, he could live in such a way that, that I think he assumed 10 out of 10 people thrown to lions tend to die due to lions. I mean, I think he expected it to be the end of his life. And that is a tough mortality rate to look face to face, isn't it? But Daniel knew his God. He knew the commands of his God. He knew the sovereignty of his God. He knew the kind, providential care of his God. And he knew it in a way that was deeper than paper. He knew it in a way that drove down deep into his bones. And therefore, he would not alter his practice because I think to Daniel that would have been akin to idolatry. Now, friends, we might be tempted to, to fear many things in this life. If you want an opportunity to fear, just open your eyes, ears, or any way in which the world presents itself to you, and you will find that, uh, that there are things to fear. Many people fear governments and what governments can do. Many people fear viruses and what viruses can do. Many people, especially Christians in America, feel discomfort and what discomfort might do. And what a lack of comfort might do. Or difficulty might do. We do not live in a risk-free kind of world. And our Savior promised us quite the opposite. He promised us that this life would be a life of perpetual dying to self. And so far from, from setting the course of our Christian life to try to avoid risk, danger at all costs, what we ought to do is then just lean into it, expecting this is part of our inheritance from what God has called us to. Part of what God has called us to is to spend and be spent for him, to pour our lives out for him, to, 
to fill up what is lacking in his sufferings alongside of him. To be hated by the world, to be afflicted, to leap, he said in the Sermon on the Mount, when you are persecuted. Not saying avoid it at all costs and try to live an insulated, safe life however you can. Daniel did not flee from it whatsoever. And he prayed. We want to note thirdly this morning, these final two points, I assure you, are shorter than the previous two points. Don't trust in princes. Don't trust in princes. Verses 12 through 18. Notice verse 11 and 12. Snitches are going to snitch. And they run and tell the king on Daniel. And it's just, it's just nauseating even to read. Oh, king, did you not say? I mean, with such eloquence, right, guys? Eloquently, you said. And they rehearse his own words back. Politicians love to hear their their policies read back to them. Nothing has changed. And, and the king says, yeah, you're right. Man, that was good. I did say that. And they say, yeah. Well, we love it. But someone who doesn't love it would be Daniel. Uh, Daniel doesn't care about you or your edict. The king in, instantly regrets it, takes every, every chance that he can to try to get them or get Daniel out of that scenario that he's in. And notice the shortness of the reach or the power of earthly kings. This king, really ruler of the world at this point in time, cannot so much as pardon a friend of his from a law that he himself made. I mean, if you want to talk about the folly that is worldly kings and princes, they can't even save people from their own laws in this scenario. And that, that's really like the sad irony of it. If you want to put your hope in princes, in human rulers, you're going to be sorely and frequently disappointed. Very disappointed. So the king can't even save Daniel. I mean, you can see why Psalm 118 verse 9, among other places, says, do not put your trust in princes, far better take refuge in the Lord. Far better. Verse 16. Very different from his predecessors in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar and others. The king says, may your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. What, what, what I, I would say is early budding faith. What a request. You're about to throw an 85-something-year-old man into a den full of hungry lions, and you say, Daniel, may your God save you. And given how he spent that night, and given the speed with which he made it to the cave in the morning, I think Cyrus believed that there was at least a chance there's another interesting motif going on in here. and We don't have a lot of time to um, develop it much at all. But Daniel and the lion's den is a bit of a resurrection kind of story, isn't it? They put him in a cave looking thing. Roll a rock over the front of it. Seal it. Someone runs the next morning to see if someone is alive. I mean, it's, it's almost as though you're reading an account of the resurrection. And in a sense, it, it almost is a resurrection story of, of Daniel. He's thrown into a place as good as dead, sealed over. I think the king didn't trust the politicians to leave the cave alone. So he sealed it to make sure no one tampered with it. And, and, and spends the night doing the same thing that the lions do, which is fast. And he runs the next day. It's a bit of a resurrection story, saying the same thing that the resurrection story does, that God delivers his people from certain death. God's providential sovereign care is such that he can deliver any one of his people. Now, while he will rescue some from the lion's den, doesn't he rescue all of his people finally and ultimately from the jaws of death? Isn't that ultimately what he has done, not just with, this, with the Lord Jesus Christ in bringing him back to life, but isn't that what happens to every man, woman, and child who believes in Christ, whom death takes? 
that they will come out of that place just like Daniel came out of the den and just like Christ came out of his tomb. Fourthly, the God who delivers. The king fasts all night, runs to the tomb or den the next day, and he, he has them break the seal, roll back the stone, and, and you can almost hear desperation in his voice as he calls out uh, in verse 20, you know, Daniel, O oh, ser- oh, oh, Daniel, servant of the living God. There's so much rich theology here. Has your God, whom you've served, continually been able to save you from the lions? Imagine the, with bated breath how he would wait for that response. Now, if I were Daniel, I would probably mess with the king a little bit at that point. <laughs> Just leave a good little while before he answered. But that's why Daniel's called a righteous man in Scripture, and I am not. I'm sure he answered immediately. It's the only time in all of the book of Daniel that Daniel says the phrase, O king, live forever. Haven't we noticed over and over again how Daniel never says that? Everyone else says it, but Daniel never says it here. And I think as a result of Cyrus or Darius's faith, Daniel answers the first words he hears, O king, live forever. And notice what Daniel says with regards to how he has survived the night. He says, my God sent his angel, my, his messenger, to shut the lion's mouths. They have not harmed me. I cannot prove it from the text, so take it as such. I wonder, heavily suspect, and like to even think that the person we find in verse 22 of Daniel chapter 6 is indeed the same individual that has already shown up in the book of Daniel previously with the three friends in the fiery furnace. It says there was one having the appearance of the son of the gods walking around in the fire with them, who I argued might be a pre-incarnate Christ. I wonder, I wonder if the lion of the tribe of Judah was in that den that night, and they wouldn't so much as open their mouths towards Daniel. Odd, the story says, no details of Daniel's night and spends far more time depict, or talking about what the king was doing. The king wasn't eating. The king wasn't, you know, watching Netflix to try to distract himself from what was going on. He, he, he was laser focused and, and, and totally distracted by what was happening in the lion's den. And nothing is told of us in the lion's Like, what was Daniel doing? I have no idea. I mean, I would have been riding a lion. He might have as well, I like to think that. But I know what wasn't happening. He was not eaten or harmed or so much as threatened. They pull him out of the cave. And then they, well, they deal with those who snitched on Daniel. And as one pastor said, Daniel's opponents got a free trip to the zoo quite a morbid passage. Why we paint this on our children's nursery walls is beyond me. It's, it's a very grisly scene, actually. I think we just do it because it's like, oh, a story with animals. Like, no, those tend to be bad in the Bible. I mean, we don't do that with Elisha and the two she-bears and the young kids. We sh- I don't know why we do it with Daniel. But God deals out judgment with those who were opposed to his people. And, and so even there, you, you can see themes coming through the text where don't worry, Christian opposed by the world. God will deal with your opponents and and the world in his timing. He deals with the world and, and perverse rulers in his own ways. And it's not for us to deal those things out. God deals with them some in this life and all in the life to come or in the judgment to come more fully. The same thing happens to them as happened to to Haman in the book of Esther. They die at the hands of their own devices. And God's man walks free. Look at how the chapter closes. Verse 25, Darius wrote to all, and we've seen this theme, we're going to see it again in chapter 7. These are the people to whom the Son of Man is, they are in his kingdom. These are his people. But notice get Darius' writing. 
people, nations, languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree in all my royal dominion. Tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Worship him. Worship him. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. His dominion shall not come to an end. We will see almost that exact same language show up in Daniel chapter 7. God is the only king, is what, is what Darius is saying. He delivers, and here's the th- beautiful theme of the chapter. He delivers and rescues and works signs and wonders on the earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. What theme did we say would be that bedrock to courageous, bold Christian living in the here and the now? A a understanding that it is God who is sovereign, who exercises providence over his people, kind providence, careful providence, loving care for his people. And, and he can even put it in the mouth of a Medo-Persian ruler to say, there's one king, his kingdom doesn't end, and he delivers his people. Sometimes in this life and always in the life that is to come. Therefore, his people can live full of courage here and now. Full of faith in this life. Not avoiding risks. Not avoiding dangers. Not living in perpetual fear. But saying, my God is a God of sovereign control of my life. I will die the day that he says I will die. Not a day sooner, not a day later. I will go and stand before his presence, and someday that is yet to happen, he will call, if, if, if I die before he comes, he will call me forth from the grave, and then I'll always be with him. Tur- turn with me, just in closing, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. I really want us to walk out of here encouraged with the power and the providence of God. I'd love to read all this chapter, but we're already over time. But that's never stopped us before. Verse 32, what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises. What's the next phrase? Stopped the mouths of lions. I cannot help but wonder if he had Daniel in mind. Quenched the power of fire. Daniel's three friends. Escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of their weakness, became mighty in war. Put foreign enemies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured. Does everyone avoid pain and torture in this life? Daniel escaped free, but not everyone. That doesn't lessen God's faithfulness at all. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release. They were offered a less risky approach to the Christian life. And they said, not for us. We won't take it. We won't touch it. Refusing to accept release and a risk-free Christian life so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in the skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandered about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Now notice this. This is where the author looks ahead to the New Covenant Church. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. The author of Hebrews, which was Paul, uh, we'll talk about that later. The author of Hebrews says that they, they lived that kind of, of courageous life. They didn't flinch in the face of risk. They didn't run away from danger. They lived that before Jesus came. 
before God had fulfilled all of his promises that were yes and amen in Christ. They, they lived in hope of that. Now, the implicit question that we should be asking is, now that we have received the full yes and amen of all the promises of God in Christ, we should live even more courageous lives. Even more bold lives. We don't look ahead to what the Messiah might one day do or would one day do. We look back and say it's all finished. It's all paid for. It's accomplished. He is raised from the dead, ascended on high, and rules as king of kings now. If anything, the boldness and the zeal and the, the courage of the New Testament church ought to dwarf what we read of those who waited in anticipation. Christian, everything that we need to live bold, courageous lives here and now is firmly laid down in the character of God. What stops us? What stops us from being the most bold, courageous people in this city? What stops us from pouring our lives out and saying, if we die, we die? Praise the Lord. If we live, we live. Praise the Lord. I pray to God that he would work this kind of courage in our hearts, developing courage and killing fear. Oh, it grieves me to see the fear in my own heart and in the heart of other Christians. Nothing in the character of God should lead us to fear. Everything in the character of God should lead us to courage. Let's pray. Our Father in God, May we live bold lives in your presence. Not so that we can feel better about ourselves. Not that we could say that we are a better cut of Christian, but because you deserve citizens who show zeal and courage for the country of Zion. You deserve citizens who, because they've been raised from the dead, spiritually fear death no more. Father, if our brave men and women in earthly militaries are willing to lay their lives down for worldly kingdoms, how much more your people Should lay our lives down. Oh God, free us from fear. Free us from the lust of a, for a risk-free life. And give us courage and confidence in our Savior. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.